We're discussing rendering today, and one of the assumptions that we have to make right away is that if you're in a place in your drawing where you're ready to start thinking about rendering, the assumption is that you have resolved the value relationships that you're going to be using. Without resolving that ahead of time, you have no business thinking about rendering. So now that that is out of the way, um, I want to move into some of the drawings that we're going to be looking at. So if, if I had to pick the perfect example of the, the, the relationship between a, a cast shadow and a core shadow, this is the drawing that I would pick. So this is by a guy named Prudhon, uh, 19th century French academic. This is kind of the standard stuff that he did. And he's really known for his the quality of his drawing. And his academic drawings are sort of the the standard for figure drawing. So, but what I want to point out is the the core shadow that starts at the left shoulder, runs down a little bit, turns into a cast shadow as it goes up to the right to the top of the other shoulder, and then that core shadow just drops down and goes all the way to the ankle. And it is precisely what you want your core shadows to look like. You're not always going to get that because the reflections are going to be different. Um, the surface is going to be different if you're drawing a lemon or a pomegranate versus uh, mussels or whatever. You know, those things are going to be different. But you want this level of clarity, especially when you're younger and you're new to the drawing thing and you're just trying to make sure that your drawings have some clarity to them. This is the, the image that you want in your head. The next drawing is by Leonardo da Vinci. And in, in my sort of mind, this is the kind of drawing and the kind of artwork that Leonardo da Vinci was best at. Like he wasn't really known for finishing things. He just liked to make studies. He would get bored with stuff and he would stop halfway through. And there are a few of his paintings that we, we have that are finished products and they're really amazing, but it's, it's, it's in the 90% of his work is unfinished. But here, he's just giving us an unbelievably um, rock solid drapery study. And so this one is, uh, it's gouache and ink, and it seems to be on some kind of a fabric. So it's kind of a painting, but He's using drawing thoughts to produce it. And what you want to be looking at here is uh, da Vinci's edge work. He combines the ideas that, that we've been discussing uh, in some of the other videos, as well as this one, uh, that have to do with planes. Um, but so each one of these individual folds has a top and a front and a side and there's just a, a real clear logic to it but the other the other thing to be looking for here is the the difference between the cast and the core shadows and how those things integrate with the big shapes because remember like we said at the beginning rendering doesn't even start to happen until the big values are in so this drawing just does a really good job of setting up those big shapes and then creating a hierarchy of value. And then once we're in there, then Da Vinci sets up a hierarchy of edges. And your core shadows are always soft, but with, with fabrics, sometimes they can be a little bit sharper. It's just that they always have to be softer than the cast shadows. And remember, in a, a drapery drawing, or in most drawings for that matter, uh, there's three different scenarios where you would have a hard edge. One is an overlapping mass, which in drapery we see all the time. You just have one fold in front of the other, it's a hard edge. You have a cast shadow, which we see again all the time, and you have an abrupt change in plane. Sometimes that will produce a, a hard edge. 
Now that's going to happen more in crumpled paper than it's going to in fabric, but it will still happen. And, uh, and, and we've switched over to this other drapery study by Dominique Ang. He was a French academic uh, painter in the late 19th century, mid, mid 19th century. And uh, this is uh, not as fine tuned a study as the Da Vinci. This one's much, much rougher, but you can see that it's, it's, it's prioritizing information and it's, it has its big shapes blocked in. It doesn't address the value problems quite as much as it probably could or as much as the Da Vinci piece does, but it, it does a nice job of laying out a structure of the objects, uh, the, the, different, the different masses, let's say, of the fabric and how they relate to each other. And you can see that he's, he's written words on different parts of the fabric and that's, he's probably writing down color notes for each one of those because it would be a study for a larger, a larger painting. So now we move on to Michael Grimaldi and he's a contemporary draftsman in New York City. And uh, the rendering here, I want to describe for a second how it's set up by his organizational drawing because that is a really important component and is why it, why it works as well as it does. Um, but he establishes very early that his darkest dark is going to be the shadows on the skin. So that's our dark. The middle value is the next value on the skin. And then the light that, all, that, that we see is the highlight on the skin. But the light is also everything else. Now there's a little shading on the shirt. There's a little shading in the background. There's a shadow on the wall. But the shadow on the wall kind of integrates with the middle values on the face. And the, the highlights and the lights on the face, that's what we're seeing everywhere else. So the, the point of all this is that he breaks the drawing down into three big, simple values. And they're not just limited to three values to the face, three values to the shirt, three values to the background. That's happening on, on a micro scale. But on the big scale, the three values are just super simple, laid out for us. It makes the drawing very easy to read, and it sets up the rendering information, which he then just goes on and totally nails. So once we're talking about rendering in this drawing, we're looking at the volume of the head, and we're looking at the edges. You can see the vast majority of the edges in the drawing are soft, especially on the inside of the head. The, the head is an overlapping mass compared to the background, so it has a hard edge on the outside. But the cast shadow on the bottom, the neck, all that area in the neck is in the dark. We have some hard edges under the eyebrows, hard edge under the lip, both lips, and then a hard edge under the nose. There's a couple in the ear, but they're kind of minor. And then everything else is varying degrees of softness. And that's the, that's the big lesson you can take away from a drawing like this. So the next drawing is by Kathy Colwitz. And she did a ton of self-portraits. And they're just some of the best graphic self-portraits that you're going to come across. Now with Colwitz, we're, we're going to start looking at a slightly different kind of drawing. So with this particular drawing, what's going on is that she's using uh, media or materials that at the scale she's using them at, it's impossible to produce a super realistic rendering. Like if we go back to the Grimaldi drawing that we just looked at, he's using graphite or charcoal and he's able to smooth it out in order to give us a, 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 an, a rendering or a surface that's, that can be extremely realistic. What we're looking at with Colwitz and several of the other images that we're gonna be looking at from here is materials that make that impossible. So as soon as you move into materials that, 
that puts you in that situation, you have to be innovative enough to make what that material is capable of pull off whatever it is you're trying to do. So when you start looking at the Colwitz drawing up close, you can see how she's being innovative with her mark making and she changes the direction of her marks here and there to describe what amounts to exactly the same information as what we've seen in some of the previous uh, drawings. But it's the, the mode of rendering is like, it, it's changed. It, it has a, an emotional quality to it that's different. It's like the marks that she's making are prickly and sharp and she's producing soft edges, like let's just say the, the coarse shadow on the nose or the coarse shadow on the cheek. She's producing this really soft, subtle edge by laying in a series of these very prickly um, sort of quill-produced uh, marks that are, like. A, but I, what I mean by quill-produced is she was probably using a metal-tipped pen that she dipped into ink and then made a couple marks with and then re-dipped it. And, but there's also a wash of brown ink underneath that. And that's something that I like to do too. And so some of my drawings at the end of this video are gonna uh, highlight that technique as well. Um, but let's move on to Lucian Freud. So Lucian Freud is, is doing some of the same things here and he's got an etching of, um, of this guy whose face just has a ton of character. And, and the other thing that's a little bit different about this drawing is it's, it's a drawing that renders the face, that kind of isolates the face up against this light background. And we're gonna see that again in a few more of these drawings. It kind of makes it a little bit more like a study in that the values aren't necessarily worked out, but if you're doing the drawing where the head is against a light background, uh, that's it's the same kind of thing, and it's it's a totally legit way to do it. Um, but his line work is completely different from Colwitz. His line work is his lines are they're longer, a little bit more elegant. There's uh, there's specific descriptions of mostly planes that he's trying to get at. And he, he doesn't really seem to have uh, a lot of difference in his edges between core shadow and cast shadow. In fact, it, it might be difficult for you to go through the drawing and find a specifically cast shadow. Most of his hard edges are actually plain changes, which might take us into a whole nother conversation about how to render form in the absence of a really clear and specific light source. But for now, we're going to stay within the realm of things that are well lit. Uh, the next drawing is by Surratt. And he was the guy that made all his paintings in the tiny little dots. So the term pointillism, um, it wasn't the term that the painters who were doing it liked. I forget what the term was, but they had like this scientific term that they liked to use. Um, but it was developing the individual dots of color to, uh, to, to render the, the image that they were drawing or painting. And so he comes in with this drawing and, and there's a whole series of these drawings where he draws on this really, really heavily textured paper. And as long as you don't do any smudging, the charcoal sits on the top of the texture of the paper and creates this pebbled look. And we could probably assign this to like a purely organizational drawing where the details are just not even really that important. But I thought it was interesting enough to present it in the context of rendering because even though all the edges are soft, he still gives us really clear coarse shadows, really clear cast shadows, it's just that the framework for seeing those things is, is a framework that starts with everything is soft, but this, there's varying degrees of soft, and that's what makes this drawing beautiful. 
The next drawing is by Anders Zorn. And if you've seen any of, any of my other videos, we've looked at Anders Zorn a couple of times. And, uh, and he was a really good late 19th century, early 20th century painter. But he had this really crazy body of very small uh, prints. And this one, I believe this one is an etching, but a lot of it looks like it's dry point because some of the lines have different values and dry point allows you to kind of play around with that a little more. But it's in the category of this line work that doesn't allow you to draw realistically and produce a flawlessly realistic image so it's very much like the Freud drawing where he's using line and direction to create that. And just uh, there's something to be said for letting the tool show up, like listening to the material that you're using and letting the tool, the line work in this case, play as big a role as you're willing to let it play and still convey the information you're trying to get. So he does a great job in this drawing of developing the organizational shading. Um, he lets his, this is a self-portrait, so he's just got this, this gangster fur coat on. And you know, for him, he's Norwegian in the late 19th century, they're wearing fur coats all over the place. So, but we can kind of chuckle a little bit and you know, think about him at like a boxer at a press conference. Um, but his, uh, his, the way he builds up his values with the inter, locked mark making is, is a really, really impressive thing. Uh, the next artist we're going to look at is Vincent van Gogh. And of course, he is a super famous artist that pretty much everybody knows who Vincent van Gogh was. And he's primarily known for his paintings. And he was kind of a proto-expressionist painter. But I want to highlight his drawing because he had this very, very short career. Um, and he produced like 900 paintings in the second half of his what when the time when he was producing work. And the first half of his artistic career, he was doing nothing but drawing. And he doesn't really get the credit that he kind of deserves for developing drawing as an art form. And he does some really innovative and interesting and unique things. And this is a portrait that he did later in his output. Um, so it has a whiff of his artistic maturity, which you could argue that he, he died early enough in his life where he never made it to artistic maturity. But all we, we don't have work after he died, so we just have to sort of place it somewhere. And he has a, a really wide variety of materials he brings into this drawing. And it ranges from brushwork with ink, bamboo quill work with ink, uh, pencil, charcoal. He's just bringing in everything he's got in this drawing. And he, he takes individual parts of the drawing and breaks it up pretty nicely by material um, and by scale. That's one of the wonderful things about this drawing. All the other drawings we've looked at, they use the material in this sort of a pure fashion where the scale of the mark making is pretty much consistent across what we're doing. Van Gogh comes in and he just completely throws that away and says that I'm going to use this material at this scale in one place, this material in another place, um, and bounces kind of back and forth. And when we get into the face, we can see that he's just making little dots. He's combining this Surratt pointillism with some of the more expressionist sort of mark making with the bamboo pen. But he never loses sight of the devices that work. And while the lighting is a little questionable in terms of finding cast shadows, his plane changes to produce slightly harder edges amidst those softer edges. Um, and his he, he uses what amounts to a core shadow to turn the form uh, in order to create volume in the face. And it's worth pointing out that the face is really round and robust where the rest of the drawing is much, much flatter. 
like he's got his head stuck through a, a hole in a flat piece of wood where this guy's outfit is on. You know, those things where you can take your picture. The next Van Gogh drawing uh, is this image of the boats. And it's a much more pure study in what is possible with a range of a couple different sizes of pen uh, quills that he's got. It's probably a bamboo pen. And these uh, almost like we would think of like a calligraphy pen with a nice flat nib. And but what he does is he changes the he has multiple values of ink laid out in front of him. So when he goes to dip the pen in the ink, he has a range of values that he gets to pick from. And so uh, the, the higher contrast and bigger marks in the foreground work their way back in space. And rendering tends to be something that's tied to objects. But I wanted to throw this one in there to show you how Van Gogh is using the same ideas in the same marks in a previous drawing to develop the space of the drawing. So this is a landscape drawing. And when you're landscape drawing, the space becomes one of the characters. And you really have to take your time and work that out. And so he has all his value contrast in the foreground and his marks get smaller and lighter and less contrasty as they get further away. And that's a basic sort of an atmospheric perspective idea that comes up everywhere in landscape work. Uh, but Van Gogh sort of stylizes it and simplifies it so he can uh, convey it along. He had a, a real hang up when it came to style. And I think the way that he talks about style is probably different than the way we talk about style now, but that's a subject for a whole nother discussion. And I wanted to finish off the video with a, a brief discussion of some of my drawings just because uh, I made them and I'm in a unique position to discuss them. Whereas I'm kind of guessing about, um, educated guessing, but guessing about a lot of the other drawings we've been talking about. So this first one is a drawing where um, you can see that I'm making a big deal about my core shadows. And I have the top of the torso blocked out as like one big value. The core shadow and reflected light for the middle of the back is another. Uh, and then the, the lowest part of the, um, the body that we're seeing ties into what's on the top, but then um, my third value is the background white, which, like I've said, it kind of makes the drawing more of a study than a drawing. Um, but the, the three different values that I have blocked out on big shapes, those are my organizational values. I knew that going in, that was part of my strategy, and and I, I do have sort of a heavy contour line in certain places, and that's by design as well. I, uh, because I didn't develop the background, if I didn't have that line there, we weren't going to see the changes in plane and, and the, the sort of body um, isolated. Um, but you can see a lot of the plane changes that are going on in the upper torso. And then in the shadows, you don't see them quite as much, but what you do see are reflections. And the, the big, simple shapes make for a nice, um, nice solid value structure that then all that information goes into. And you can see, especially in the shoulders, it gets very detailed very quickly. The next drawing is an, an old drawing of mine. And I kind of wish it was developed a little bit more in terms of the space and everything. But I wanted to show it because when we go to the close-up, it has... Um, it has some details that I think explain a lot of the, the big ideas that we've been kicking around in this video. And so if we take this shadow that's just above the armpit, it's kind of, it curves with the deltoid. And what I want to point out is that it has this very soft core shadow, but it's not really deep enough to be a real shadow. Like if you look at the bottom of the arm, that's a core shadow. It's, it's dark on the edge. It goes into reflection, and then we have the edge, and it's a little bit lighter underneath it, so it's slightly, slightly darker edge. But the core shadow is really, really clear. When we move into this more triangle-shaped shadow that's just to the right of that, it has a soft edge and a core shadow at the top, but it never has a cast shadow. But what I ended up doing was if the top and the left are the soft edge of that shape, I let it be a little bit darker, 
But then when I got to the right hand side of the shape, I allowed it to have a sharp edge as if there was a cast shadow there, even though there wasn't one. And it just makes the plane change from shadow to light. It, it makes it really solid. So it kind of looks like the deltoid muscle that that shadow is describing is on top and the muscle from the back that's kind of coming in from the right and moving into that shadow to the left is going sort of under it. And you can see that throughout different parts of the drawing as the arm moves to the left and we see the shadow going up. There's some pretty good articulation of the different muscle masses and how they go uh, one on top of the other or one goes under it. And the last drawing that I'm going to torture you with is this portrait drawing where you can see it's more of a study than anything. I really don't, other than working out the value in the head and then comparing that to the lighter figure, or the lighter background, um, those are the big value relationships I had worked out. It has kind of an unfinished quality to it, um, but you'll have to trust me when I say that these figure drawings that I have where the background is white paper, we did in fact set this figure up against a white sheet so that I would have that, that value relationship because this is the way I wanted to do the drawing in the first place. So uh, this particular model just had really awesome features that, uh, that we used to have her come back over and over again to do um, portrait settings. And I did uh, the original, uh, like the initial block in of values on her face was done in gouache and you can see some of the drops of uh, that just produced by me moving quickly from my palette to the paper and some of the drips sort of flew through the air but I used the the big uh, va the gouache to do the big values and then once that dried I came in with the charcoal and I was able to uh, develop my main concern was the volume of the head so you can see the big uh, sort of juicy core shadow that runs through the cheek and the, and then the side of the head is more of a plane change uh, there wasn't as big a shadow there and then once you have that then you can go into the face and develop some of the uh, some of the specifics uh, and render the details so hopefully uh, that rundown of a whole bunch of different artists uh, gave you guys an idea of uh, just some of the bigger ideas that you can, uh, the different avenues that you can go down and engage in when it comes to rendering, because you're not just limited to how realistic can I make this drawing. You have lots of options, and we haven't even exhausted them all in discussion yet. So there'll be more to come.